Hi, this is Emma Hemming-Willis. And I'm Helen Cristoni. Welcome to our Make Time podcast. We are two women on a mission to uncover the secrets of making time for everything. From work and relationships to our brain, body, and beauty. We'll explore it all and share it with all of you. We interview experts so we can discover more practical tips to make time so we have more time for our family, friends, and ourselves. So join us as we chat with incredible guests who share their expertise on all the ways we can learn to make time, especially for you. Okay, it's time to make time. Dr. Annie Fenn is a physician, chef, and author of The Brain Health Kitchen, Preventing Alzheimer's Through Food, a science-based cookbook and care manual for the brain. She founded the Brain Health Kitchen, the only cooking school of its kind, focused exclusively on helping people prevent cognitive decline through food and lifestyle. After 20 years as a board-certified OBGYN, she traded in her stethoscope for an apron to pursue her passion for the culinary arts. But it was her mother's diagnosis with dementia that helped Fenn find her path and her new calling, one that enabled her to not only help her mother, but also create significant and meaningful impact for others. So let's make time for Dr. Annie Fenn. Hi, Dr. Annie Fenn. Welcome to the Make Time Podcast. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Oh, hi, Emma. Hi, Ellen. It's so good to be here. And please call me Annie. Okay, Annie, we'll call you Annie. So Annie, I have been following your your just what you do for a long time because I, you, Helen and I are both very much into brain health and, you know, looking at your book and recipes on how to keep nourishing our brains. And that is something that you are very good at. Can you just sort of tell us about you and how you got to this space? Sure. Well, my path is a little bit different. I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm an OBGYN doctor, so I spent a big part of my life delivering babies, taking care of women, doing you know gynecological surgery, all the things that OBGYNs do. In the last eight years of my practice, I actually focused specifically on menopausal women, mm-hmm. and that's where I became interested in brain health because a lot of my patients were coming in with menopausal symptoms that were the ones that bothered them the most were the cognitive symptoms like, you know, like just cognitive lapses and not being able to retrieve words. And, you know, back then there wasn't a lot of information about the impact of menopause on cognition. So anyways, I practiced OB for 20 years, decided to retire. And I was in my mid forties. I was a little early to retire, but I just had this feeling like I wanted to do something else. I wanted a more flexible lifestyle. I wanted a healthier life. You know, as an OBGYN, there's not a lot of sleep. It's hard to get exercise, um, family commitments. It's just really tough. So I wanted sort of a different life that could tap into the creative side of my brain. So I decided to um, go to culinary school because I've always been a cook. Ever since I was a teenager, I've been cooking It's from scratch. And I went to culinary school and I came back in my community and started teaching healthy cooking. So I really felt like the root cause of a lot of the things I saw, even in OBGYN, were due to like lack of nutrition and not the best lifestyle. So I was teaching healthy Mediterranean classes, healthy Mexican classes, healthy Moroccan classes. I was doing all this work. Um, this was around 2013. And I started to see papers in the scientific literature about the link between nutrition and dementia. And became really interested in this and started teaching brain health cooking classes at my local hospital. So I was doing all of this work. And this was when my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So as luck was have it, I was starting to focus on this um, as a passion and a mission. And then, it, and then it really hit home, you know. And so I decided to exclusively focus on helping people eat to prevent Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. Um, through food. And I decided to do it as a cooking school because, you know, what what better place than the kitchen to bring people together, to teach them some new skills, to learn, um, to appreciate like how good healthy food can taste and just make it like a really enjoyable camaraderie of learning. Um, so that's when I founded the Brain Health Kitchen as a cooking school. And that was 10 years ago. And I've been focused on this ever since. 
I think it's really great. Like, so I went through menopause early, like 10 years ago, believe it or not. And I, I really relate to what you're saying about like, I, I couldn't even, I didn't even know what was going on. I couldn't think I could put two to get two and two together in business meetings. I would just lose my train of thought. And it gave me actually a lot of anxiety. And, and one of the things I did do early on was, was change my my habits and my food habits and so i'm really excited to to talk to you about this today yeah no yeah. me too i um i you know even for me like i i have not gone through menopause yet but i'm sure it's knocking on my door mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean you know i suffered from intense brain fog um which is why i we launched Make Time Wellness. I was taking supplements and lifestyle change and all of this. And I, I started to see a difference. And, and one of the things was really about changing what I put into my body. Um, so that's, that has been very helpful, I think, to me. So let, let's get into this. So, Annie, what is the most important thing you make time for and why? Well, I make time to nourish myself with the right foods. And, you know, I come from a scientific background, but also from the love of food and the love of cooking and the enjoyment of making nice meals. Um, but you don't have to be like a cook to, to access brain healthy nutrition. Um, I have to make time for it because sometimes it requires a little bit of planning. Um, but once you start to eat a brain healthy dietary pattern, I don't like the word diet, but it might slip into a conversation. What we're really talking about is brain protective dietary patterns. And there's a handful of them that have been studied in terms of the risk of preventing Alzheimer's in particular. So there's a way of eating that has been shown to prevent Alzheimer's by as much as 53%. And the key thing about this is it's not a diet. It's not, you know, going on this in January and then going off of it in February. Like you don't even like to think of it that way. It's more like folding into the way you eat and the way you live certain foods that have been proven to be neuroprotective. So I make time for this. My mother has Alzheimer's. Um, it is very important to me. And I've read all the studies. And so I know that this is uh, probably the most impactful thing that I have the power to do. 53%, that is a huge, that is one of the biggest percentages I think I've heard thus far when it comes to brain health. Yeah, this comes from a mind dying study that was published in 2015. They took a group of about a thousand people who did not have dementia. They all had healthy brains. They followed them over the course of four and a half years. And they set up criteria for this dietary pattern, which is a spinoff of the Mediterranean diet, which most people probably recognize. Um, but it's the Mediterranean diet made to be more brain specific by adding berries, by adding leafy greens, things of that nature. And what they found was that the people that adhere to this diet most strictly you know, they're ticking off all the boxes of the 10 brain healthy food groups more often. They had a 53% reduction in being diagnosed. And these, these people were entering age groups where they're at higher risk for Alzheimer's. Like they were in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So they're getting into those age groups where, you know, a certain number of people will get diagnosed. Now, the cool thing about this study also shows that um, the people that didn't follow it very, very strictly, the people that followed the dietary pattern about half the time, because, you know, changing your, the way you eat can be really hard. I mean, these people were trying hard, but they only changed it about half the time. They still had a 37% reduction in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. That's fascinating. Now, this is just one study that I've been replicated in other countries. And we have lots of other, um, you know, biological plausibility type studies to show why this would be true. Like each of the 10 brain healthy food groups, and we can get into that, um, have a whole mountain of science about them. Like for example, berries is a, le is a brain healthy food group, leafy greens, vegetables, nuts, um, beans and legumes, whole grains, fish and seafood, poultry, extra virgin olive oil, so when you look at all of these individual food groups, they all have amounts of data to say why they're neuroprotective, um, including like MRI studies to look at, say, people that eat more leafy greens. There was one study done years ago showing that if you eat leafy greens um, about once, with, once a day um, over the course of time, your brain looks 11 years younger on MRI compared to someone who eats like a salad rarely, like once a month. 
You know, it's interesting that you say that because in my own family, um, the U.S. half of my family, we, we've we've had a lot of dementia in in my family here. And then I have the other half of my family that lives in Greece. And there's just been like no Alzheimer's and dementia on the Greek side. And so one would think that they have such different eating habits in Greece and we do here in the States that it, it just really makes a difference. Yeah, they're hardcore into the Mediterranean diet over there. Yeah, that's yeah. just a way of life. It's very different, you know, to how we are are eating and nourishing, quote unquote, our body here in the U.S. So I think what most people don't understand, at least about Alzheimer's in particular, which is my focus, um, is that Alzheimer's is largely preventable, and that most of the things that you can do to prevent it are actually in your power. It's the choices you make with your dietary choices. It's what you eat. It's your exercise, it's your sleep, it's having some sort of form of stress mitigation in your life. If you travel to a Mediterranean country, like I spend a lot of time in Italy, I do brain health retreats over there, and the Italians have pauses built into their day that are stress-reducing, like stopping at 10 o'clock and going down to the local bar for a coffee, meeting a friend, or take, even taking a walk after lunch. You know, these things are part of the culture. It's just what you do. Whereas in the U.S., you know, at least for me, there's this tendency to be in my office and work as hard as I can <laughs> until I can't sit anymore. You know, like you have to actually really make yourself take a little break, go for a walk, meet a friend for coffee. But in these Mediterranean countries, the lifestyle really wraps, the, wraps their arms around these people to support their brain health in ways that they don't even have to think about. Um, and they do have less dementia in these countries. All right. I mean, that's why we have started this movement called the Make Time Movement, which is really about, you know, um, you know, some like for Helen and I, we are very busy and we have to schedule to make time for ourselves to get up from behind our desk and get outside. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, grabbing a friend and going for a walk and just getting that time outside, like making time is so important. And I know I'm speaking for both Emma and myself when I say like, we so want to come to your your brain healthy retreat in Italy. <laughs> Sign us yeah. up, please. There was another one you were doing in Costa Rica. I'm like, we're, we're, we're going to that. The one in Costa Rica is amazing. It's all plant-based food. It's alcohol-free. It's, it's a real retreat you know, where you can do really fun things like walk to the waterfall and go down by the beach, but there's a lot of education involved. And in Italy, they're more like culinary and cultural educational vacations, um, but they're both wonderful. People tell me that they're life-changing. And the reason I started doing it is because, you know, I write a lot about brain-healthy lifestyle, brain-healthy eating. I give a lot of speaking engagements where I talk about it. You know, it's my life's work. It is my mission to help people take care of their brains. But I find that having a week-long immersive retreat is a game changer for people because they're thinking about it all the time and then they take home a toolbox. And I keep in, I keep in touch with all my retreat um, you know, graduates and they're still, you know, they're still in the game. They're in the game. Attention, all busy women. Let me introduce you to Make Time Wellness the wellness brand that's here to make your life a little easier. Say goodbye to the hassle of multiple pills. We have crafted delicious drink mixes that are packed with brain-boosting, body-nurturing, and beauty-enhancing ingredients. Make Time supplements are the perfect addition to your daily routine. We have loaded them with key essential ingredients like MCTs, omegas, biotin, multivitamins, and curcumin. You will feel the difference in no time. Ready to give it a try? Head over to maketimewellness.com forward slash podcast 20 and you will get 20% off your first order. Make your brain, body, and beauty a priority today with Make Time Wellness. So Annie, for our listeners who are, are so busy, I mean, they're, you know, they're they're either at work and they they have the super busy lifestyle. They have kids. They're they're in school drop off. Can you please give us like three very actionable ways that our make time listeners can can achieve this in their life? Absolutely, and I totally get where you guys are coming from. I mean, I was an OB-GYN doctor raising two small boys, 
And I was the only person in my family that really cooked. And I would come home from work at like six or seven to a house full of hungry people. <laughs> so I had to develop some really stealth cooking techniques, um, some organizational techniques. So I would say the three things I would do would all fall under the headline of make the brain healthy choice the most convenient one, the easiest choice. Okay. Because our default when we're really busy is to grab something to eat just because everyone's hungry. And that probably is not going to be the brain healthiest choice. Okay. It might be fast food, fried food, pastries, sweets. Um, all of these are brain harming foods have been, you know, you know, in studies. So I would say, how do you make the brain healthiest choice the easiest one? And I would submit the most delicious. It takes a little bit of thought. It takes a little bit of planning. Um, you have to prioritize your brain health. So you have to think of that. Like, why am I taking care of my brain? Why do I want my kids to see me taking care of my brain? How do I take care of their brains so they have these habits when they're grown up and cooking for themselves? So one is to have pantry staples on hand that you can make brain healthy meals on the fly without even having to go to the grocery store. Okay. So I think of these pantry staples not as minimally processed foods, which their categories are, but like conveniently healthy foods. So I would include salsa verde, okay? Peppers are a vegetable that are extremely brain healthy. They have a ton of flavonoids. Flavonoids is a bioactive substance that we get from plants that's been shown to protect the brain from oxidative stress. So you might think of salsa or, you know, it's like just a condiment that a lot of people use. But salsa verde is actually really good for you as long as it's got a short, clean ingredient list. I can make a whole meal on a salsa verde. There's one recipe in my book that's that's basically from all pantry staples. You take a bag of frozen butternut squash and some frozen corn. Um, you cut open some peppers. You have to have those on hand. And then you stuff them with the butternut squash, a little bit of feta cheese. You put salsa verde on the bottom of the pan, and then you cover the peppers with that. So it's a really just delicious, brain-healthy stuffed peppers. It's got all these vegetables in it and all this fiber. Um, another one I love is canned beans. I like cooking beans from scratch, and my book goes into like all the ways you can do that, like an instant pot on the stove. But I'm just as likely to reach for canned beans, like black beans, cannellini beans. Um, I like to put them in soup. I like to make, um, you know, pasta fagioli, like uh, pasta and bean dishes like I learned in Italy. Um, I like to stuff peppers with them. I like to make dips out of them. Um, a lot of kids don't love beans, but they'll eat black bean dip and they'll eat hummus, right? Which you can buy store-bought and really good quality. So canned beans is another one. Frozen vegetables and frozen berries. Sometimes they're even better than fresh, you know, and... It's, it's so hard to go to the grocery store and bring home all this beautiful produce and then your family ends up eating out or you do something else and it all goes bad. But frozen berries are frozen at the peak of ripeness. So they have more of these brain health nutrients that I want everybody to get into their lives every day. Um, so frozen berries are great. You can make a dessert out of it. You can, of course, throw them in a smoothie. Um, you can just put them out in, um, you know, in bowls and let them sit for a few minutes and then add yogurt and granola and toppings like that. So I'm a big fan of convenience foods like that. Now, another way to do it is travel, planning the food when you travel. I travel a ton um, for Brain Health Kitchen, and um, I was really discouraged about it at first when I was getting into the swing of it. I went on a five-month book tour last year, and I was on a plane like almost every single day. Um, and I finally decided that I have to be a really strategic planner if I'm going to travel that much because I don't want to eat the food in airports for the most part. And I don't want to eat the food on airplanes. So I take time to pack myself a little care package. I've always done that for my kids. I've always packed them really nice lunches. I've always, you know, given them little care packages when they travel. So I just decided to do it for myself. And I might have a small container of hummus with some carrot sticks. I might have some, you know, nuts. Um, I like medjool dates. And I'll get one of those uh, almond butter packets, those single serving packets and I'll squeeze it inside the date, and that's just a really satiating snack. It has a lot of fiber, it has a lot of fat, so it really quells hunger uh, effectively. Um, I, I make homemade granola, but you can also buy good store-bought granola. I have a black pepper and turmeric granola in the book that I love because it's kind of savory, not too sweet. I have a matcha granola in the book that I also love to travel with. It's kind of a treat, and it's got a tiny bit of caffeine in it, which I like. Um, so yes, I plan my, my travel. Um, snacks. And I'll also bring um, sachets of green tea. Green tea has a lot of brain health benefits. 
um, that have been proven. And then I'm less likely to go to one of those coffee shops and get like a foo-foo drink that I know is not good for me. It's got artificial sweeteners or sweeteners in it and it's got stuff in it. And um, when all I really want is a, is a good cup of green tea. So I just bring my own and then all I need to do is ask for hot water. Yeah, it's truly just about being proactive, planning, being a little bit ahead of, you know, your day and your week or whatever, right? Yeah, and I really love the airport, you know, kind of hack because I always, I can be so great at home. I find like I get into a really great rhythm when I'm at home. And then the minute I have to get on a plane, it all goes out the window, you know? So that was really, really helpful for me. Yeah, no, me too. I was just on a plane the other day and I was like, yeah, I'll have the croissant <laughs> with butter and some jam. <laughs> so, well, yeah, calorie some pie in a pie. And, you know, in the travel snacks, take that same strategy into like the busy daily life. I was a soccer mom and there was one year I think I managed my one of my kids' teams when he was 13. Um, so think about your travel snacks. Just put like a little bit of thought into what you might put into your travel package. Um, and throw that in your backpack or your purse when you're going to drop off kids or pick them up and it's always during dinner hour and you know you're going to be hungry. Um, so you might have a hard boiled egg, you might have some hummus, you might have your carrot sticks. Um, these are really good foods for your brain that are also going to tide you over to a meal. Annie, what are you not making time for that you're going to commit to making more time for today? Oh, this is such a good one. <laughs> I actually have a list that I could give you. I'm going to pick one. Um, I need to do nothing sometimes. My days are pretty full. Um, I'm constantly reading the medical literature about how to help people take care of their brains. Uh, a new study comes out and I pour over it. I spend much of my day doing this. Um, I write a newsletter twice a week that's science-based. I also develop recipes. I'm traveling, like I said, you know, I have, I, I fill my days pretty well. I'm pretty good at that. What I'm not good at is just, um, doing nothing. And I know that when you don't have a lot in front of you, like technology or things that you're reading, um, that's where the created creativity comes in. Um, if you're able to just sit with yourself, maybe it's going for a walk without, you know, listening to a podcast or something. Um, then that's when you start to get really great ideas. And so I need to just do nothing. And I do have a meditation practice, which would probably qualify, but this seems different because when I'm meditating, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go do my meditation now. Um, I feel like it's something that I'm doing. When I'm doing nothing, I feel like my brain um, just has more leeway to, to amble and, and think and create. So I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna try and make time. You have to put making time um for nothing in your calendar. I think that's one of the key things is just block the time and, you know, force yourself to just kind of commit. I, I love it. I want to make time to do nothing. I'm going to do a 30 minute block of make time to do nothing. Yeah. We should do that. Let's all do it. Let's all do that. I think people that are very busy and driven um, often feel very uncomfortable with doing nothing. And so I think it's something that maybe you can train your body and your brain to get more comfortable with. I wanted to, I know that there are some people that are listening, but there are some people that are watching this. I have the, the Brain Health Kitchen book, Preventing Alzheimer's Through Food. This is your book with 100 recipes. Um, it is so, there's so many beautiful recipes and not difficult, Cute. you know, like. No, 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 they're easy. They're easy. Yeah. I mean, they look so beautiful. That can be easy, they're doable. These are foods that I want people to fold into their lives. Um, like that recipe is, how do you make a meal out of store-bought hummus? Something I, I do a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a beautiful book. Each chapter is a different brain-healthy food group. And I did that because I want people to dip their toes into maybe food groups that they don't normally eat. One of the overriding um, concepts of eating for brain health is diversity you know, not being on a restrictive diet, not eliminating any foods unless you, you know, medically can't eat them for some reason. So some people might be like, oh, I can't eat beans. I tried 10 years ago and I just can't do it. Um, I would, you know, encourage them to look at that chapter 
maybe you maybe beans you can't digest them well because your body's not used to it you don't have the gut microbiota to digest them because they haven't developed that but maybe you could use chickpea flour which is really nutrient dense high protein flour um technically a bean and have cookies in there even that you can make from chickpea flour that are delicious so i want people to be encouraged to diversify their diet to fit in these 10 brain healthy food groups to limit or avoid the foods that we know are brain harming we have a lot of data on this. It is, it is not um, controversial whatsoever. There's a lot of data about how to eat for brain health. And I want people to be able to access that. Annie, how can we find you? We want our listeners to know how they can find you, sign up for your newsletter. I'm going to include the Brain Health Kitchen uh, link to, this, you know, to your book in our show notes. But please let us know how our listeners can find you. Oh, sure. So I'm over on Instagram at Brain Health Kitchen. I do a lot of education over there. Um, I also have a newsletter on Substack. It's at brainhealthkitchen.substack.com. You can join for a free newsletter. You can upgrade to a paying one. I also have a tier where I do four live cooking classes with my community there as a founding member. And that's really fun as well. It also becomes like a Q&A um, or a kitchen chat, I like to call them. And then my book, Brain Health Kitchen, you can get pretty much at most bookstores. There's a lot of indie bookstores that ca that um, carry it, and it's also online. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm all over the country, <laughs> usually. <laughs> Giving talks, speaking at medical schools, I'm teaching college courses in brain healthy nutrition now, trying to reach younger brains. You know, most of the data on how to prevent Alzheimer's specifically comes from what people do at midlife you know, their habits at midlife, whether they're smoking, exercising, how they're eating. But now we're starting to learn that 20s and 30s and early 40s is also a very important time to cultivate brain health for later. So trying to uh, reach younger brains is an expanded part of my mission as well. Well, Annie, you know, we are so thankful for everything that you're doing. And we we are just really excited to have you on today. And I've personally learned so much from this podcast. So thank you so much for being on the Make Time podcast today. Really, really happy to have you. Oh, thank you. It's such, a, such an honor to meet you all and to be able to talk about this with you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. We hope that listening to our podcast has empowered you to make more time for yourself. So please remember to subscribe and share with a friend who could also use a healthy reminder on the importance of making time. Make sure to tune in as we will continue to have incredible guests that will share their make time tips on our upcoming episodes. Come say hi to us over on at make time pod on social media or visit us at maketimewellness.com. Until next time, make time.